Welcome, Pewter Report readers, viewers, and listeners to a brand new edition of the Pewter Report podcast, energized by Celsius, the official energy drink of PewterReport.com. It is a Thursday edition of the show. I want to say hello to all the Pewter people that are filing into the comments. And we are saving the best for last because it is a bit of a homecoming. Topic of today's show, we're going to be talking about the Bucks' first round draft strategy with the draft coming up in late April. We'll also talk about the press conference that we had today with Bucks general manager Jason Light with some videos to come along with it. I'm your host, Matt Matera. Joined with me is the face that runs the place at pewterreport.com, SR Scott Reynolds. And joining us this afternoon, it is a homecoming, like I said, a Pewter Report alumni and Hall of Famer. You can see him on programs like NFL Network, Up in Adams, and the Dan Patrick Show. He is the lead draft analyst for Pro Football Focus and the co-creator of the Off-Ball Defensive Tackle. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, joining the show, Pro Football Focus's Trevor Sikama. Oh, fellas, it's so good to be with you guys. Um, that's one of my favorite intros that I've, <laughs> that I've ever had the pleasure of hearing. Um, it's it's so great to be back on the Peter Report podcast. So many wonderful memories being on here with you fine gentlemen and yeah. so i'm excited to be back and to talk a little bucks football here with you so i just appreciate wanna, you having just me. want to apologize we're not as good looking as Kay adams so there's uh, look, that hey come on don't sell yourself short well I mean, it's, you it, know you know high bar but i mean you guys are right there it's <laughs> okay. neck and neck you really are okay i appreciate that. that is high praise um uh, let's see Let, let's get right into it so um uh, the Buccaneers, they're picking at 26. Back back in the day, Trevor, when you were a part of the Pew Report team, they didn't pick this high. I mean, they were they were picking top 10, man. So um, so now things have changed. Jason Light has gotten used to uh, picking later in the first round, which presents its own set of challenges. It's a long night. You're letting the board come to you. It's not quite 32 where it was in the 2021 draft, but um, uh, he'd like for it to, to get back down there. Um, real quick, just give us your, your take on, on, um, you know, your thoughts on, on the Bucks needs and, and picking 26, um, some players that, that you think might be around and it might not be that the Buccaneers would have some interest in. Yeah. I'm excited to have this conversation with you guys, obviously, because, you know, with me not being in the Tampa area, not being a current pewter reporter, I'll always yep. say that I am a pewter reporter, but yep. just, you know, actively on the payroll. Correct. Although, if, you know, if you, want to put me back, if you want to put me back at the payroll, I'm not going to, I won't, I won't like it, but you know, so yeah. the, the Peter Fort ring of honor, if you will, yes. um, yeah, you're in the Peter Fort ring of honor. <laughs> That's truly a, an honor to say that. But um, look, I, I think that as I cover this draft nationally, sure. I keep close tabs on the bucks, but I'm excited to kind of have these conversations with you guys about some of their team needs, but here's how I see them from more of a national perspective, not being as in the weeds as you guys are. Uh, on the offensive side of things, I look at a couple of things. Mm -hmm. I think certainly we might as well start with saying Jason did an incredible job bringing back the talent that he needed oh, to bring, yeah. right? Yeah. And even if you look at this team currently and you say, well, you know, they weren't exactly world beaters last year and they just kind of like brought their own guys back. I mean, is that really supposed to get me that excited? I mean, it should because it could have been a lot worse. Like they had a lot of yeah. big time contributing players who could have very well gone right. elsewhere. And at least I think they have a baseline to continue to get better. Hopefully even have a better year that they would yeah. like to. But on the offensive side of the ball, I think they're set at receiver for this year. However, you know, is this going to be the receiver room for the long term? Mike's obviously getting older. He signs the extension, which is great, but he's obviously getting a little bit older. They're going right. to have a contract decision with Chris Godwin. So that's kind of like a, a, a far distant need. I think tight end and r running back, I kind of clumped together as sort of the mm -hmm. same level of need for this team where you got a guy, you're okay with the guy, but if there is a big time upgrade to be had, I don't think you'd shy too much away from it. Right. Um, Kate Otten's been good for them. Rashad White yeah. has been good for them. And I still think that even if they draft somebody, those would be contributing players. But I think that you could upgrade in those two areas. Mm -hmm. I think they're pretty good along the offensive line. There's one guard spot, one center spot, same thing. Kind of could use upgrades yeah. when we talk about these guys at 26. That, to me, on offense is where the conversation really begins. If they're going to yeah. pick anybody in the first round, in my opinion, on the offense side of the ball, I think it's going to be an offensive line. It's going right. to be he's got flexibility, versatility, 
We know Jason loves his offensive tackles that move back into guard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You got it. guard. It's on the screen right there. I've been a big Graham Barton guy throughout this entire draft process. Yeah. I think he would be perfect for them. I think Troy Fontanu would be perfect as well from Washington, but he's not making it to 26. Right. Yeah. Can't really talk about him there. And then, you know, you've got some other players like, you know, maybe a Jordan Morgan who he's played more offensive tackle. Yeah. Shorter arms could kick him into inside, but you know, does he have the body type to be able to be a guard? I think that's kind of the conversation that you have yeah. there. And then on the defensive side of things, the interior's good, right? I mean, you got right. Clutch Kansas, you got Vita Bea. Edge is a big need for them, right? Joe Tryon Jr. Yeah. hasn't exactly extended to the level that you wanted him to. Yeah. Um, the same can be said with Logan Hall. You like what you saw with Yaya Diaby last year, but can he continue to grow off of that? No more Shaq Barry, even though Shaq was kind of declining from that big sack season that he had, you know, whatever it was, three, four years ago. He has right. the Achilles injury, you move on from him. But still, it's a veteran presence that's, that's lost in the room. So I think that they could certainly stand to in the first round, prioritize a guy who's going to be able to really get after the passer. Um, yeah. yeah, you got, again, one of my favorites on the screen right there, Leatu yep. Latu, if mm -hmm. make it to him at 26. I mean, he's a, he, he'd be phenomenal for them. And then corner, corner's the S spot, right? You look at, okay, Antoine Winfield Jr., he's not going anywhere. You bring back Jordan Whitehead, okay? You're, you're all right, at least for the starters at safety. But corners, you move on from Carlton Davis. Jamel Dean's basically sitting here, going to have to be CB1 for this team, uh, which is a tall task, I think. Mm -hmm. Todd Bowles can like Zion McCollum, but it's a lot different when you got to go out, go out and play him as a starting outside cornerback every single week. Um, Christian Azeem was decent in the slot last year. And then uh, Tivier Thomas, I believe I said his yeah. name correctly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I liked what he was able to do in the slot for Houston last year. So I like that addition, but still corner really big to me. So you yeah, guys like, Kool Aid McKinstry, if he is there, certainly Cooper DeJean, if he is there. Yeah. Um, you know, like those kinds of corners, I think about maybe being on the clock for them at number 26 or on the board for them at 26, I should say. So ultimately, Spark knows version of it interior offensive line, edge rusher, cornerback. Those are the three positions that I look at for the first round. Yeah. I, I think when you look at, at the receiver position, and, and Matt and I, we've kind of been leaning more towards, you know, possibly a receiver there. Or if none of those guys we talked about, the Jackson Powers Johnson, we did mention his name, but, you know, he's in the mix. Uh, right. The, yeah. Yep. The, you know, the the Graham Bartons, the, the Leatu Latus, if, if those guys are gone, right? And Jason even admitted when it came to drafting last year, Kalaja Kansi was the last guy in their first round their pool guy. that was left, right? And they, they took him. Hmm. And so, uh, and, and that, that's how a lot of, I think a lot of fans, and we've tried to do our best to educate them throughout the years. It's not like the, they have all of these guys ranked, right? Um, the Buccaneers, like most teams, go into the draft with about somewhere between 40 to 60 players that they like. And that's really about it. The guys that are that are that are scheme fits for what they do, that that check the character box that that don't have the injury or the character issues, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think fans would be shocked at how many players are really taken off draft boards, either due to medicals or due to character. And these are some big name players too. And you always see it on ESPN or NFL network, right? When, when uh, uh, you have a guy that was maybe like a second or third round pick and he falls to like the fifth round, I can't believe he's still on the board. Well, right. <laughs> you know, teams know about that character issue that, that hasn't come to light yet or the injury history, et cetera. And, and that's why that happens. But, but uh, they, they have pools of players, right, that they would pick at 26. And once that pool is dried up, then it's time to trade down and all of that, you know. And so mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we asked Jason about today was uh, – well, let me just go back, back to my topic here. Uh, we, we were gonna, we've kind of said the wide receiver is also kind of a need just because you want to take a look at, at next year. You know, Trey Palmer's wide receiver three. And Palmer – uh, had some ups and downs last year. He was a sixth round pick. So sometimes you get what you pay for, right? Right. But um, Mike Evans and Chris Godwin both played 17 games last year. You know, now they're going to be 31 and 28 respectively. Chris, as you mentioned, is on the last year of his deal. But this is the Rams offense that they're going to be playing this year. Not so much the Seahawks. A lot less 12 personnel, a lot more 11. So you're going to have three wide receivers on the field pretty much all the time. That's going to be a starting position. And so with an eye towards next year, you draft another guy at wide receiver, maybe not in the first round, but maybe in the second round. And so if, if um, you know, if, if the offensive linemen are off the boards, if the cornerbacks that are there, you know, they're not terribly fond of, if the, the edge rushers are there, 
Who are some wide receivers that might be at 26? Maybe you trade that down a little bit, but who would, who could be some guys there that, that interest you for Tampa Bay? Yeah, I, I look, there's a lot of good wide receivers in this draft class. And I think I, I can understand wanting one of the first round wide receivers. Like if you're going to tell yourself, Hey, wide receivers kind of a need for this team. It's very tempting to pick one in the first round just because there's a lot of really, really good ones. Yeah. But it's I do feel too. right. That's the thing is that I yeah. think the depth of the class is going to trump the allurement of wanting to take one in the first round. If you're mm-hmm. in Tampa situation, just because yeah. of those positions that I kind of brought up previously, but yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of, there are a lot of really great wide receivers in this class that can be available on day two, either in the second or the third round. Like I think about guys, if Troy Franklin from Oregon is somebody who makes it to their pick in the second round, it's a little mm-hmm. bit later. So that would be quite a fall for him, but like, he's somebody that I'd be interested in Jalen Polk from Washington, yeah. you know, Romo Dunze yeah. gets a lot of the, 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 the pub, but um, my, it's funny enough, my, my co-host on our NFL draft podcast, the NFL stock exchange, Connor Rogers, he loves Jalen Polk. I think he has Jalen Polk as wide receiver four in this class. Mm-hmm. He's um, so good. Was it four or was it six? I can't remember what it was. It was it, but it was high. It was it was he's very high on Jalen Polk. And the reason why he's so in on Jalen Polk is because he said he reminds me of Chris Godwin. Yeah. Like he reminds mm-hmm. me of this guy who is just going to go up full arms extension, contested catches, not afraid to go over the middle, yeah. not afraid to do the physical parts of playing the receiver position. And so like that is, it's a funny Tampa parallel if they were to be interested in him because you could totally right. see it with their game style there. So I think Polk, Xavier Leggett, you know, if he makes it to that yeah. part of the second round, I think he should interest them as well. You get into the third round and I think guys like Javon Baker from UCF, mm-hmm. uh, Jamari Thrash from Louisville, um, I think I, you know, and then you kind of get into some small, there's a lot of small receivers in this draft yeah. who you're kind of either in on that or you're not right. Like right. I think of Malik Washington and Taj Washington and Jacob Cowing and like yeah. maybe even Anaya Smith, right? These mm-hmm. just smaller receivers who either you kind of believe that they're going to overcome lower measurables, lower percentiles there, or right. you're not. And so I think that the wide receiver boards are going to be very different this year specifically because there's a lot of those small receivers that were uber productive in college over the last couple of years. Obviously, we yeah. see Malik Washington there as one yeah. of them. But to me, those are some names that when I think about Tampa, those mm-hmm. are some connections that I make with them. It's funny you you bring up Troy Franklin first because a lot of people like to think of the Bucks' new wide receiver coach, Brian McClendon, and his connection to Georgia, which is – Obviously very apparent, but yeah. he was at Oregon right before that. And I actually spoke to Troy Franklin at the Combine about working with Brian McClendon before. So that's certainly some scouting that the Bucs will know a little bit more than maybe, you know, some other teams around the league. But talking about Chris Godwin, I'm just curious your thoughts about him going into this season. Because I think the reason why we're talking about a potential replacement for him is that it's so tough to pay two wide receivers $20 million right. per season, yeah. which... It's what they're doing with Mike and Chris. And a couple of years ago, you know, when they won the Super Bowl and when AB was there, there was a discussion of like, who's the best wide receiver out of the three. Right now it's like clear and apparent that Mike Evans is the guy. You just look at what he did last season. And that's what kind of sucks about the business because Chris Godwin hasn't been bad. Like he's had two straight thousand yard seasons coming back from that torn ACL injury, but he's not the Chris Godwin that we all saw like in 2019 in James's last year or what he mm-hmm. did in 2020 or even 2021 right up until he got injured. So uh, there's a lot of talk this year about with Liam Cohen coming in, they're going to move him back to the slot, which is where he really kind of thrived when Bruce Arians first got there. Just curious about your outlook about Chris Godwin going into this season. Look, Godwin's awesome and he deserves to get paid. I, I don't know if Tampa's going to be the team to do it. Um, he seems like just wire to wire that he like Mike Evans, honestly has, just yeah. loved being in Tampa Bay. The organization oh, yeah. loves him. He's just super reliable of a player. You know you're going to get everything you can out of him. And so those are the dudes that you don't want to lose, right? Those are the guys that you want to pay. But you do look at it like, okay, well, you know, Evans is now above 30 years old. When you pay Godwin, he's going to be 28. Okay, he's obviously come off one major knee injury. Is that something where we're, we want to be paying now two wide receivers a lot of money and, you know, who knows how much longer Mike is going to play? You know, I don't think that he's like retirement is imminent or anything, yeah, but right. maybe you can convince yourself, hey, 
when we signed Godwin, the maximum amount of time that we would be paying two wide receivers a lot of money, two older wide receivers, I should say, a lot of money is like two years max, maybe one year. So you can kind of convince yourself of that to say, no, 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 we're it's it's like we're overlapping a little bit, but that's okay. We can budget for it. But it is tougher. Like if if this was a different situation where even with the ACL injury, like yeah. if Godwin comes out of the draft and he's because how old was he came out of the draft? He was 21 and then he signed his second contract when he was, I think, 24 or 25. If he was in that situation again, where yeah. you're signing a 25 year old, yeah, I think maybe the conversation's a little bit different, and you're oh, more sure. okay just saying, "Yeah, we'll pay him basically yeah. no matter what." And if we've got to pay two great wide receivers right. for two years, it is yeah. what it is. But to pay a 28 year old Chris Godwin and then a over 30 year old Mike Evans, right? Well, that's where you start Godwin, to get it gets a little yeah. tricky. Godwin's gonna be 29 next year, right? He'll be 29 in February. So okay, like, so it's 20, it's 29 next year. Okay, be 29, yeah, 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 right. Yeah. And so, so, so then, that's what makes it tough. That's what makes it tough. Yeah. So let, let, let me ask you, we thrown out some of those names there. So, um, and I think, you know, Cooper DeGene's also another one here. We've got um, uh, Lord Jimbo too. SR, why no ho- uh, hype around Cooper DeGene? You can play all three positions, nickel, boundary, and returner. We haven't had good special teams since before the Obama administration. <laughs> good um, reference. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's, been a, it's been a minute, right, since we've seen any type of return for a touchdown mm-hmm. in Tampa Bay. Uh, let's Let's talk about, um, Cooper DeGene for a minute. Let's throw him in the mix because I would love to see him. I, I'm a big fan of his game. I think the versatility is is something that would would please Todd Bowles, right? Mm-hmm. We saw we saw Zion McCollum when Jamel Dean and Carlton Davis got healthy for that Eagles playoff game. He throws a curveball and puts Zion McCollum at safety to get more speed in the field because Ryan, uh, you know, Neil was was such a liability. Liability. Uh, so uh, to me, uh, he would be another guy in the mix. But out of those guys, Barton. Uh, Jackson Powers Johnson, uh, Liatu Latu, and let's say Cooper DeGene. Um, any of those guys have a chance of really being there? Because that's that's the one thing that Jason said at his press conference today was the, the toughest thing about drafting this late is you just don't know who's going to be there. Right, right. No, and it's and it's tough. And look, I, I think Cooper DeGene would be perfect for yeah. this team, genuinely. Like, Plays a lot of off coverage stuff. You know, he'll play soft coverage, but I also think that he has the athleticism and the strength to play press coverage when you want him in that situation. Yeah. If you're playing him in press man, you're sort of inviting what is one of his few weaknesses, and that is he's just a bigger dude. So yeah. flipping the hips is a little bit slower Turning than it is for some of these yeah. other guys. Right. And, and I wouldn't say he's not bad at it. It's just he's so good at so many other things. That's the area where if you put him in press man a lot, you would be just kind of inviting some of his shortcomings to show yeah. more often. Whereas you leave him in off coverage, you let him take a look at the quarterback. I mean, he is mm-hmm. just so instinctive. The ball hawk. Dude, it it yeah. is incredible. There are a couple of interceptions. I went through and I was actually watching his turnovers not too long ago. And there's one play where I th- I think what I was was doing was kind of like a man match concept. And mm-hmm. the guy that he had the man match on ended up going inside almost immediately, like it was mm-hmm. a dig route. So DeGene's just retreating almost as if it's like it's like a cover three look right and it's it's the interception where he's not really supposed to be there but yeah. he plays it so well that he sees where the where the receiver is going he runs the route for the receiver right. and he has the <laughs> over the shoulder catch to yeah. like get the interception and then he takes that to the house like yeah. he turns around and he house calls it so like to your point the versatility, the off coverage ability, the tackling, how good mm-hmm. of a tackler he is. This dude's phenomenal. So if he gets into the Bucks, they, they would absolutely love him. So, but again, it's so hard to think that he would. I've seen it happen before in mock drafts. Like I've mm-hmm. seen Barton get to them. I've seen yep. Layatu Latu get to them. I've seen yep. Jackson Paris Johnson get to them. But it's if it's one of them, it's probably only one of them, right? right. It's yeah. it, it, it happens yeah. to be a mock draft simulation where okay. This guy fell for whatever reason. The corner yeah. run started later. The interior offensive line run started later. The edge run started later, whatever it is. Yeah. I, I do think that it's realistic that one of those guys could be there. And I think I saw, I think I saw you guys tweeting about this at, at Jason's presser. He said, what was it like five to seven players? Yeah. yeah. We uh we actually got the video. So yeah, why don't why don't we play it right now? Let's see it. Just in general, is it more of a challenge to, to pick down there? 
I would say that the biggest challenge, at least for me, is you're trying to target who might be there. And we say this all the time, we say it to all the prospects that are coming in and visiting the top 30, that no one knows how this is gonna go. So if somebody's telling you, you know, they know where you're going, they're lying. Um, only one team right now knows who they're taking probably, and maybe they don't, but it's, so you you try to, you know, narrow, right now we have five to seven guys we think might be there. And then you start kind of falling in love with them and they're like, okay, one of these guys is gonna be there and we're gonna be so happy, but then there's the chance that none of them are. So I think that's the, the hardest part about picking down their plate. How many were left when Kalijah Kansi was still on the board last year? Kalijah. Yeah, he was hit. We were happy with that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a, it, it's a great look into, I think, the draft process overall and also mm -hmm. why Jason's so good at it. Right. Yeah. Um, they're not worried about their valuation. Right. Like he runs such a great scouting department to where I love how he set it up. Like it, it, it's kind of like buckets and tiers. Like we are comfortable drafting these players at 26. Yeah. None of them are there. Like you right. said, we're probably trading down because yeah. we trust our scouting evaluation process to be that. And I'm just going to let you know, it's not like that all around the NFL. Right. I mean, right. like there's <laughs> like, there are a lot of guys who like want to make decisions in front offices or ownership or whatever. And mm -hmm. it just, I, I think that that's a great look there from Jason and it's not like spoiling anything. Like it's right. a good process. Yeah. This is what you would want anyways. And um, it's just a really good look into, and it's, and it's another reminder of like, man, it's no wonder why the bucks have had such fantastic drafts over the last four or five years Yeah, because they have a, fantastic process that I think, you know, Scott, you and I talked about this a little bit before of yeah. Jason's earlier years as a general manager, the mm -hmm. things he had to learn, you know, like yeah. that. And, and, and he's even said that to you and me, like just the lessons right. that he has had to learn in 2016. That, right. And it's <laughs> like, wipe out. yeah. What, um, God, what year is this for him? 10, nine. This is 11. Yeah, he started in 2014. His right. first pick, his first pick was was pretty good, Mike Evans. Yeah, yeah. not bad, not bad. It's really started that's there. really not bad. Going wire to wire with the guy that you got. So he got that one right, obviously. Yeah. But there are yeah. some, some lumps along the way, and there yeah. always is going to be with the right. draft. But you can just tell with the Bucks. I would say like hit rate, even relative to just the guys that fit their scheme and the coaching right. staff, and like some of the later round guys that have really been able to hang mm -hmm. on and contribute and things like that. They've got a really good process down, and that's a really good look into it. It's look, the Patriots kind of get made fun of during the mm -hmm. Belichick era. Of they're like, Patriots have twenty guys in their draft board, like right. twenty, like that's it. Like yep. they've got twenty guys, and like these are Patriot players. Yep. And if it's not one of these guys, we don't care about them. We're not drafting them, and that's how you get like Cole Strange going in the first right. round right. and things like yeah, that. But that um, and Nikhil you know, Harry and all that. You, right, exactly. You got to expand it a little bit bigger than I think what the Patriots had under the Belichick era. But um, again, like Jason's process right there, I think is a good one. Yeah, well, and, and I, 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 let me, I was going to say real quick sure. just about that, Matt is is his first pick ever was Mike Evans, right? Mm. And and Jason talked about it today. You're not just drafting the player; you're drafting the person, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. So his first pick ever was Hall of Fame player, Hall of Fame person. I mean, you talk about charity and philanthropy and just caring what he means about to the community. community. Yeah, here and in Galveston, right? Not just in Tampa, but Galveston as well. So his second ever pick was Austin Safarian Jenkins, just a turd of a person, you know? And and it's like, uh, you know, to go from looking at the talent, and the talent was there. I mean, big six foot six tight end right. in Washington and all right. that, you know? And, but but you know he flamed out because he wasn't a good player wasn't didn't have the, the good character to go with that so I think he has learned some lessons along the yeah way. all I was gonna say is kind of to your point Trevor of everything you were saying about the Bucks trusting their own process and believing in what they're doing I think two really good examples of that is the year that they drafted Tristan Wirfs let's remember they traded up one spot yep. to go mm -hmm. get Tristan Wirfs and. You know, in the moment, you're kind of thinking, like, really? You got to trade up one spot? You weren't even sure that San Francisco was was even going to draft the tackle there? But you know, Tristan Wirfs is going to go down as one of the greatest picks that Jason Light ever made. And then a couple seasons later, they traded out of the first round. And sure, Logan Hall hasn't necessarily panned out. But at the time, they remember Louis Seen was a guy that was kind of connected to, to the Buccaneers. And they yeah. thought, all right, maybe Seen. Mm. maybe uh, Logan Hall, and they were able to acquire a couple more draft picks because of that. So it just speaks to, again, 
the confidence in this group and why Bucks fans should have trust in these guys and girls in the, in the front office. Because again, Baker Mayfield did not hit free agency. Mike Evans right. did not hit free agency. They came back home at the end of the day. Yeah, and it is, you know, not that uh, not that I'm, I'm trying to make it a, you know, a Jason Love Fest, although if he's yeah. watching the podcast, he probably loves it. But, you know, <laughs> when you when you trade down, kind mm-hmm. of like where they did when they did the Logan Hall thing, it's like, because w- was that the year they were picking 32? Was that when they were picking 32? No, Which, that was, um, they traded down from 26. 20, so 20, so yeah. 26, yeah. right? So if you kind of go along with what he said today, mm-hmm. If they had a bucket of players that they thought were that they would have been comfortable with the 26. Right. And let's say none of them were there, that's when you start to invite, okay, let's trade down. Yeah. There might not have been, you got to think about it. They've got buckets of players that they were comfortable with at 26. Yeah. And then they would have had a bucket of players that they would have been comfortable with wherever it was, like back into the second round. Yeah. You're not trading all the way back there. Right. Honestly, like trade partners are very out of your control. Oh, yeah, that's right. Maybe. You might might want to move down and nobody wants to move up. That's the thing. And it's like, okay, people look at the Logan Hall pick and they go, man, I mean, that was basically like a first-round pick that isn't playing like a first-round pick. You don't even know if necessarily the team viewed him like that. Like, they might have viewed Logan Hall as second tier. Correct. But all they could do was get to 33, and they couldn't really get any further down than that. So then they take the guy that would have been, quote-unquote, next for them. But it's just, again, it's it's... it's we talk a lot about like picks, fits, things like draft planning from general mm-hmm. managers. Whenever we get a peer into that, that's the stuff that I'm always so fascinated in. Yeah, um, Jason had a really good a little uh, clip about. I'm not sure if we have the clip, Matt, uh, but uh, of Jason talking about trading. Do you have that clip? Oh, of course, we got right, it. Let, let's uh, let's get to that and react to it because I really want to get into the strategy of the first round here. We talked about some of the players that may or may not be there. Let's play this clip and uh, we'll have you react to it, Trevor. Yep. Here's what Jason Light had to say about what goes into trading up or down in a draft. What goes into whether you trade up or down? When do you kind of get a feel or or, or you, when do you have those powwows with your, your people in the war room about when to go up and get a guy or when to trade down? Is that on the clock? Is that a couple picks ahead of time? Or walk us through some of those instances you've had. So in the past, our trade ups and trade downs, we've we've started that process typically around now, and so we are too right now. Um, and so you don't want to make rash decisions. At least I don't on draft day. Um, emotional decisions that can come back and bite you. You want to be as clear minded as you can when you're making when you're putting that together. We've got a big chart. Um, a certain number of players. That, got three players remaining and you're 10 picks out, you know, all those types of things. And it depends on what players are available too. So they're still there. So um, we kind of have a pretty good feel going into the draft. Um, you know, I'd say around pick 20, we'll, we'll know if we want to start attempting to move up or, or not. But I would say right now, I like the thought of the way I, I really have a lot of trust in my staff um, and both coaching staff and scouting staff, how we been operating that those picks seem pretty uh, important to me right now so so it doesn't seem like jason light it would be really willing to trade to move up necessarily right and get rid of one of those the, maybe the extra third round pick they acquired for the carlton davis trade but mm-hmm. um in my recent srs fab five uh, i kind of champion the cause of if, if you think that jackson powers johnson is Ryan Jensen 2.0? And I, I kind of think he is. And if you think Graham Barton is Ali Marpet 2.0, and you, mm-hmm. you heard him at the combine, he almost sounds like Marpet a little bit, you know? <laughs> um, if you have a chance to get a, a, a player of that caliber, right? You, you got to get in front of Dallas because they're probably going to take one of those guys, uh, if not a, an offensive tackle. But it, you kind of heard Jason answer my question. It took him a while to get there. But around number 20, that's kind of where you start thinking, okay, now if we're going to trade up, you know, let's do it. And right. so uh, are there any players, like let's say you're sitting there at 26 and and you've got, you do the math and you say, we'll, we'll probably only have one of these guys hit from our cluster, our, our bucket, if you will. Who's the guy that you would trade up for? Uh, of, of those players we've kind of mentioned, the Jackson, yeah. Bowers, Johnson, the, the uh, Leatu Latus, the, right. 
Graham Bartons. Who are you going up to get, Trevor? Yeah, no, I mean, it's 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 an interesting thought, kind of the impact that those interior offensive linemen could have. I mean, uh, for Graham Barton, if he's going to be the next Ally Marpet, they should just take him to Green Lemon when he's on his top 30 visit and just oh, see yeah. how many tacos he can eat because, you know, that was a that was a big part of, uh, right. of Ally Marpet's uh, renown in Tampa. No, but, uh, you know, I think uh, Barton would be so good for them. Honestly, I've heard there are some rumors of Jackson Powers Johnson not exactly having the cleanest medicals. Like yeah. I can't, I've, I've heard – either the neck or the back or something like that. And mm-hmm. I, I haven't necessarily heard anything concrete yet, but yeah. I've heard that from multiple people that there might be something there. And so for a player like that, maybe you're not trading up. So mm-hmm. the two that, that come to my mind genuinely are Leao Tulatu and Grant Barton. These mm-hmm. are immediate starters. These yeah. are longtime starters. These are high impact players, I think. Now that that's just how I view them and how they could fit the bucks and how they could really, really help out this team. And, um, you know, I, I that's, th- those are the two guys that I think they would, that would be worth trading up for. But Scott, I don't know if you know this off of the, off the top of your head, if you you've looked this up before, what's the highest draft pick Jason's ever traded? Cause it can't be that high because Jason, it, Jason, well- he Jason. only traded up once in, uh, you know, in, in the first round. And that was just one spot to get Tristan Wirfs. Right. And, and, what, and that was a fourth rounder. Right. Ex- exactly. Yeah. And it's like people, I try to kind of tell people all the time, like anytime this conversation comes up, like yeah. they think about the Bucks, and they'll be like, oh, maybe the Bucks will be this like sleeper team to move up big in the first round. And I always tell people, Jason yeah. loves to draft. Yeah. He understands and he fully believes the way you build a good football team is through the draft. And to me, unless he gets a fourth round comp pick and a fifth round comp pick, like I don't even think he'd trade a third round comp pick, right? I mean, because that yeah. means that you lost somebody that's important and you're going to want to draft somebody to yeah. fill the holes on your team. Yeah. So to me, it's it's always like even those little trade ups, like yeah. like people people look at. People always look at extra draft capital and they say, ooh, what could this team be thinking? Yeah. I don't think the Bucks look at that third round pick from Detroit and think, okay, this is expendable draft capital to move up. Yeah, it's another I, th- player. They're going to, to yeah. use that pick. Yes. The the only thing that I think they could move on from, because I have their picks up right here, mm-hmm. is like, like the sixth round comp pick, I guess, but that's mm-hmm. their only pick in the sixth round right now. So I yeah. don't think they're going to want to do that. They got They got seven picks right now. They're divvied up pretty well. They don't have a fifth rounder, but they have a third rounder. So Mm -hmm. you trade that every time. And I just, I don't really, I don't really know if they're going to be even moving up for any of these players because I I don't think Jason's going to want to even part with that fourth round pick because I think he knows that it's too valuable for him. Yeah, good stuff. We have, uh, speaking of value, we have some super chats uh, with uh, with you here on on the show. Uh, A couple of of, uh, questions here for you. Uh, This one here from Realtor. David Zussman, 999 mm. Super Chat. Thank you. You seem very low on Cooper BB based on your rankings. He should go by pick 125, but most mocks have him going in the middle of the second round. Where do you think he'll go? Now, to be fair, this is, I think, the pro football focus rankings of which you are part of the team. But you yes. do every <laughs> mock so you in. in every <laughs> ranking for, for PFF, right? But so So I don't do every mock, but the big board on there is mostly my stuff. Okay. So, so it really is. And I don't, I don't shy away from this at all. When I, so I, I think I'm the lowest <laughs> on like everybody when it comes to Cooper BB in the industry, ultimately to answer the question, I think BB is going to be somewhere between a late second, early th- third round pick. That's where I think he is going to be drafted. Yeah. He will be higher than 125 for me on my, on our final big board that's coming out on Monday. But I can already tell you, like, I still think I'm going to have him more as like a, fringe third fourth rounder than a lot of these other analysts who like him in the second round and the reason why is i mean he's got really good tapes got i hate taking a shot at one of your kids no, no, no. Hey, you know what uh, matt you can be my witness have i stood on the table for cooper bb have i championed no. cooper bb have we no not not cooper at all bb in any of the mocks for the bucks we have so, not it's because here's because here's the thing with him i think that he's been really steady and solid obviously yes. his verse the versatility part of it i shy away from a little bit because people go like oh look how versatile he is well he's got second percentile arm length for a guard so 
you're not really saying that he can play tackle for you. So to exactly. me, that that versatility part in the NFL does not exist. If anything, right. he's a guard or center. He's, like I said, got below fifth percentile arm length. I think it's below fifth percentile wingspan. Yep. Yeah, I think it's below 20th percentile in height. Mm-hmm. And I just think the feet are sometimes slow out of his stance. Agreed. I just don't think he's a, a great athlete. And the other thing is that even with him being, God, what did he weigh at the combine? I think they got a list list is somewhere between like 320, 330. Yeah, and he his, played at 335 at K State. He so, was bigger. So he and, and you look at his frame, like his frame's as filled out as it could be. You can't exactly. look at Cooper Beebe and say, okay, well, if we pack some extra pounds on him, you, right. you he what you see is what you get with him. Yep. I also don't think he's that imposing with his strength I at agree. 335. Yep. So I think this is a very smart offensive lineman. Yeah. Understands I that. I don't think he's understands leverage really well. Yeah. Consistent hand placement knows how to wall guys off. You know, he knows how to kind of, I always say this, like he he gets an A in geometry for offensive line play because he understands like the angles and using momentum and all this stuff to just wall guys off. He is a smart offensive lineman, but there's so much of the physical part of playing the game at the NFL level that he is deficient on. So that's why I've got him as a more of like a mid round pick. Yep. Um, I think if you got him in the early parts of day three, you'd be really happy. If you draft him in the late third round, I think he could be fine for you. But yep. ultimately there's a lot of other people in this industry that think Cooper BB is absolutely a starting long time starting guard in the NFL level. And I'm just not there with how athletic he is. Just sticking with that for a second. And I mean, j- just to show you pewter people, I am not a Kansas state Homer. And we're going to ask about Ricky Pearsall for all you Florida Gators because he he is a, a little bit of a Gator homer. Or maybe we'll see. Um, but but Dominic Pooney from KU, mm-hmm. I, I like him better as a player that can move inside to guard or center for this team. We, we've actually had him, a Kansas Jayhawk, believe it or not, in our mock draft uh, because uh, he's he's a bigger guy. And I think you know he showed well moving inside at the Senior Bowl. And if you're looking for, you know, that day two guy that if you strike out on interior offensive line in the first round, you got second round and two third round picks to work from. And if, if he's on the board and, uh, you know, you know I, I might take him over Cooper Beebe. My own. So I can't remember who I have ranked higher. I think I have Pooney ranked higher, but. I'm a little bit I'm a little bit lower on Pooney too, just because I think that he needs a lot more refinement. Like I think he, he is a uh, his body. Yeah. He yeah, he does. He does. And and I don't hate the interior O line versatility talk with him, although he is over six feet. He's oh, he's over six five. So that'd yeah. be a tall center. So it yeah. just it's kind of you have to think about like, okay, is this now going to be a hindrance to the quarterback who's got to look over you and look over the line of scrimmage? That's often why. I think like you're 6'1". Come on, Trevor. Give him some credit. Like, okay, well, yeah, I mean, he's 6'1". He's got to look over the helmet of a guy who's 6'5". Right, and with the helmet yeah. on, he's probably 6'6". Six, six. It makes it a little bit yeah. more difficult. So I think that's the thing, Like, right? Like, I think a lot of people like Joe Tippman in last year's draft yeah. because yeah. he was a 6'5", six 6'6", six six center. And they're like, ooh, look at the length. Look at the size of center. It's like, okay, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a positive, but your quarterback better be tall enough. Like, he better right. be able to see over top of him. So – that's just something that you got to think about as well. Trevor, who's a player in the, in this draft class? Doesn't even have to be Bucks related or offensive line that we're talking about right now, but a player that you're fond of that maybe isn't a first round pick or maybe that people aren't even as high on, but when you watch the tape or you read more into them, you're just a big fan of this player. Sure. I mean, there's a handful of guys at a lot of different positions where I think this, this question could be, could be answered with like Bucky Irving from the running back position. Yeah. I mean, I really like Bucky Irving. I know he's smaller. I know he didn't yeah. test really great athletically, but we've got it's two metrics. film. <laughs> That's the thing. And, and, and we have, film. we have two metrics at PFF that I, I love to lean on that help separate running backs and ball carriers from the offensive line in front of them. Right. Because mm-hmm. that's the age old question. It's like, Oh, guy has a lot of rushing yards, a lot of rushing touchdowns, a healthy yards per carry average. It's like, well, is it just the offensive line in front of him? You know, is it him what's going on? So a good way to individualize that no matter what the offensive line is in front of them, a good one or a bad one, miss tackles force per attempt, because mm-hmm. that shows anytime you get in a situation where you have the ability to make a guy miss, are you yeah. making a guy miss? And Bucky Irving's is incredibly high. And then Yards after contact. So again, that could be contact behind the line of scrimmage, could be yeah. contact at the line of scrimmage, could be contact five, 10 yards down the field. But whenever you get when you get hit, 
how many yards do you get after that? And again, yeah. Bucky Irving, very high yards after contact per attempt average. So really like Bucky Irving a lot. That's somebody who immediately come to, comes to mind as one of like my guys, if you will. Um, I think the same can be said for Javon Bullard, the mm -hmm. nickel defender slate safety from Georgia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Man, for, for him to get on the field as a true sophomore underclassman on that defense in that mm -hmm. program just shows you, full pun intended, like what kind of a dog this dude is. Yeah. And I think that he's wired different. He just wants to be great, loves to come up and hit despite the size. Um, I think he's really feisty with all different types of receivers in the slot. So um, he's also somebody – those are the two that I think came to my mind right away as like guys that I'm higher on, that I'd bang the table for if they were on the – if they were uh, uh, available around the round that's appropriate for him. Well, we talked about this a second ago, and, uh, you know, you are, uh, you know, a proud Florida Gator. And so let's talk about Ricky Pearsall, right, who, you know, uh, I don't know if he was at the, the Bucks local pro day, but he could have been. He was eligible for that. Sometimes these guys just don't have the uh, the time to make all of the visits and whatnot. But um, what are your thoughts on, on Ricky Pearsall? You know, if the Buccaneers are looking for a slot receiver, he certainly uh, made a dramatic catch this year, probably the catch of the year and showed really well at the senior bowl. Yeah, Ricky's awesome. And and I, I will I, I gave love to a Georgia Bulldog a couple yep. minutes ago. Yep, so yep. you know that I'm not uh, I'm not gonna be biased when I say that um Ricky had a phenomenal year. He really did. There, there's not many players in this draft class who bet who had a better, I would say, calendar year than mm -hmm. Ricky Pearsall did, right? Moving on from Anthony Richardson, and I feel like he could have been more reliable with Richardson, honestly. Like yeah. had a handful of drops the year before, just wasn't really the receiver that they wanted him to be as that wide receiver one on that team. With Graham Mertz at quarterback, he really became that wide receiver one option this past year. You, mm -hmm. you, of course, you highlight the one-handed catch, but he was such a great route runner, tempoed routes, understood how to beat different leverages. Um, and also, I think that he showcased that, yes, say, if the Bucks were to draft him this year, he would be their slot receiver. He'd be their wide receiver three. Right. But he is somebody who I think has more in the tank. Like, I genuinely think he could be a wide receiver too, right? He yeah. could take over and you could play him on the outside. And I think that that could work because of um, how smart he is, how, 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 how good his routes are, how athletic mm -hmm. he is, that athletic ceiling that he brings. So you mentioned he also put it on guys at the senior bowl too. So it's just been a really great draft season for him. And I think that uh, if they were to somehow get their hands on him as their wide receiver three this year, all of a sudden that is a, really nice trio of wide receivers for Liam Cohen to work with. He was uh, friends with Rashad White as well. That's right, yeah. Arizona State. Okay. Yeah, going yes. back to Arizona State. That like, had one of the greatest teams of all time, Dude, of, of like yeah. players that transferred to other places. Insane what-if team of Jaden Daniels, Johnny yeah. Wilson, Ricky mm -hmm. Pearsall, Rashad White. Yeah. Nuts. Stupid. Yeah. Herb yeah. Edwards. Could have had it all. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Could have had uh, just those recruiting violations scared everybody away, you so, know, and cost you know, him his job. You know. A couple other receivers I wanted to, to uh, pick your brain about real quick. Um, Lad McConkey, right? So a lot mm -hmm. of people are kind of making the assumption that Brian McClendon knows this guy and all of this. We had Greg Cosell on last Thursday from NFL Films and just kind of asked him, put him on the spot and say, you know, who would be a good fit? And he's like, well, th this is kind of the Rams offense. You look at, at you know, Puka Nakua, you know, Cooper Cup, guys like that. And the guy he mentioned was Lad McConkey, just in terms of being able to separate, work the middle of the field, but can also play outside, which is where he like actually played more outside. He's like, but I think with his short area, uh, start stop ability, his ability to to really run with tempo, his routes, mm -hmm. right, and and separate and hit the gas when he needs to and, and hit the brakes. Um, what are your thoughts on, on Lad McConkey? I've seen him in some first round, uh, you know, mocks, but is he a first rounder? The production, I know I watched a ton of Georgia. It's really kind of a 50-50 run pass. It's old throwback SEC type offense, but it's a bunch of points with under, you know, under um, Todd Munkin for years mm -hmm. and then Mike Bobo last year. But uh, it, it, the offense ran through you know, Brock Bowers, but your thoughts on McConkey and how he would fit. And if, if that's, if he's worth a first round pick, he's awesome. Um, he's wide receiver seven for me. And my people might hear that and be like, Oh, that's low on him. I mean, it's a stacked wide receiver class, man. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the top mm -hmm. three wide receivers would all be wide receiver one and basically every other draft class. And they right. all happen to be in this one. So McConkey in most other drafts, like for example, last year's draft, you'd have people talk about McConkey as wide receiver one in last year's draft. Now, yeah. I don't I don't know if he'd be consensus wide receiver one, yeah. but he'd be top three for sure. You know, what you're he, had, he would be a top 10 pick, top 15 pick last year. You're saying like overall? 
Uh, yeah. I mean, if, if you're saying wide receiver one, um, I mean, granted, you, you got other positions to factor in there, but I, I mean, think, I think just his, you know, it's funny because like, I think his size being smaller, I'd be comfortable saying he'd absolutely would have gone between 15 and 25 last year. Okay. Like, yeah. like, cause the wide receiver run was going to start a little bit later anyways, but right. like, if he's in that group, he is one of those wide receivers going 15 through 25 and maybe he's the first off the board. Maybe not, but like Zay flowers, uh, Jordan Addison, Quentin yeah. Johnston. I mean, there's so many people who would tell you they like lab McConkey over like all of those guys or most yeah. of those guys or whatever. But you know, you mentioned it. He's more than just a slot receiver. I think his, mm -hmm. I think Greg is totally right. His skill set would be phenomenal in the slot and they put him in the mm -hmm. slot a lot uh, when he was at the senior bowl. And <laughs> it was funny. It was kind of like cor corners, you know how like corners like rotate in and obviously yeah. you, you, um, you want to get as much work as possible when you're going through the practices. Yeah. But you could tell that corners were like, God, I'm going to get no, put I'm on good. I, You take this one. Like, like I'm going to get put <laughs> yeah. on an Instagram highlight reel if I go up against McConkie because yeah. it's just going to be, you know, music in the background and McConkie yeah. just absolutely cooking somebody for a route. And they're yeah. like, damn, there, there's me. That's me for that one. So, <laughs> you know, it just shows you the kind of body control that this guy has. Former lacrosse player. So he's a really nice all around athlete just mm -hmm. in, in total. But, He's got the long speed to be able to attack vertically. You know, yeah. a lot of times you have these shorter, shiftier slot receivers, and they're just underneath guys. They can't really threaten vertically. Yeah. McConkey absolutely can. So when he right. puts the when he puts the brakes on you for a double move, and he kind of like fakes inside, and then does mm -hmm. like let's say like he's running like a sluggo route, where it's like boom, slant, and then, oops, I'm just I'm I'm up. I mean, right. if you don't plan for that, if you bite on that too quickly because you know how devastating he can be as a quick hit receiver, mm -hmm. I mean, he'll smoke you. He'll smoke yeah. you deep down the field. So he, again, just like Pierce, would be perfect as a wide receiver three for this team. I don't, I don't know if they'd take him at 26. I haven't really thought of it like that. Yeah. I feel like if, I don't know if I'm not confident he's going to be in their five to seven bucket, right. but I would tell you yeah. that if it's a situation like, God, what year were we just talking about? 2021, whatever 20, the year was. 2022. 2022. Trade all. down, right? If you trade down. down to the beginning of the second round or something, you feel then better taking them there. You yeah, yeah, more I think, draft capital. I think yeah. you would. Yeah, I think you would do that. Yeah, those those Georgia teams were some fantastic teams over the past couple of years. So it's no surprise that they have great prospects coming out this year. Almost as great as the flavors of Celsius energy drinks, the official energy drink of PeterReport.com and the Peter Report podcast. We always keep the vibes high on this show, so make sure you check out all the vibe flavors. The Galaxy vibe is new along with the Astro vibe. I personally love the Arctic vibe. That's my favorite flavor. And you can't go wrong with the Cosmic vibe or the uh, Peach vibe or Tropical vibe. So you get my point. Celsius, great flavors. If you need to know where to find a Celsius energy drink, go to the Celsius store locator on their website. Punch in your address, and it'll tell you the closest geographical location where you could pick one up. Could be a Walmart, health and fitness store, 7-Eleven, or if you're lucky enough, it might just be your bodega. Bodega. <laughs> and once you keep going to your bodega and you know you love Celsius, but you're like, I don't want to just get one or two. I want to get it in bulk. You can get it in bulk. I'd recommend doing the variety pack because variety is the spice of life. Don't limit yourself to one great flavor of Celsius. So go to Amazon, click on the subscribe and save. And you can have a Celsius sent to your place of residence whenever you want. You're in charge. You're the captain now. So make Celsius your number one pick during this draft season. Celsius, the official energy drink of the Pewter Report podcast. Got another Great. super chat as yeah. well. Shout out to Leighton Carter for the $5 super chat. Longtime Pewter Report fan who says, my guy Trevor, so glad to hear you. As always, my guy Layton. I remember yeah. obviously going back and forth with Layton plenty yep. when I was in my uh, uh, when I was in my again active pewter report yes. days. And so, big shout out to Layton. Good to good to see you still in the chat. Obviously, reading pewter report like I knew you would. Two other targets or weapons, I think, for Baker Mayfield that I want to address. And just because these guys uh, are well, both of these guys have been in for top thirty visits, and uh, both of them, well, actually, Ben Sennett was not a, a formal interview at the combine but they did an interview him and he told me yeah the bucks have been showing a lot of interest in me going back to the senior bowl but uh keon coleman was also a formal interview your thoughts on coleman because he's kind of a polarizing figure in the scouting community um i think if this guy didn't have that four six one if we're talking four five one i think a lot of people feel a lot differently about him but 
sometimes that four six one shows up on tape. Sometimes it doesn't. What are your right. thoughts? Uh, you know, no bias now as a Gator, but I mean, what are your <laughs> thoughts on on Keon Coleman? Um, you know, he, he does have that big catch radius. That's something that Liam Cohen really values in receivers. Is is uh, somebody that can go up and get those contested catches like like Evans does? Look. No bias here going into the season. I had Keon Coleman as my wide receiver four, and I loved him. You know, he was close to those big three for me when I was watching the Michigan State tape. And then this past year, he just did not separate very well. I mean, he yeah. was like 15th percentile in the country yeah. in open target percentage. And you watch the film and you see how athletic this guy is, how explosive he is, but it's like he's running his route just straight into the chest of defenders. And I, yeah. I, I wonder why that's me. It's almost like he is just inviting contested catches. And I don't know if it's something that he's being taught or what, because I think he's a good athlete, right? There are yeah. times when I'll watch him and he'll run a route and I'll be like, okay, are you just kind of more of a linear explosive athlete? You're just not very flexible. Like you don't have that turn. You, you quick, you, you, you know, the hips are a little bit slower to turn. You don't yeah. have that lateral agility to you. Is that just the kind of athlete you are? And then I'll watch him get a screen pass or field a punt in punt return, mm -hmm. and he turns into this like backyard playmaker. And I go, I where, is, where is that when you're running a route? Right. Yeah. Okay. Look, you brought up the combine numbers. Yeah. Four, six, one, 40 yard dash is right. terrible for a player that, that is this athletic. Yeah. And I said, goodness. Okay. Look, some people just have a bad day. Yep. You know, some people just aren't like track runners, whatever. Mm -hmm. We get to Florida State's pro day. Didn't run. He didn't run. Yeah, he's he, didn't run. he, st he stood on a four six one. Yeah, you don't do that. What are you running in training? Yeah, like what? I just he he is yeah. he is. So I I have him wide receiver eight because mm -hmm. it's hard to fully quit the guy, right? Like he's right. just he's too athletic. He's too strong at the catch point. Yeah. And I'll say this: like he is he's got some of the best contested catch mm -hmm. you know highlights that we have this past year. There are a, a handful of a good amount of contested catches that he does not come away with. But guess right. what? It's because contested catches are hard to live by. Right. It's hard to feed your family off contested catches. That's right. And and it's just it, it's there's so many good wide receivers that were good at this in college that yeah. failed to be able to replicate it at the NFL level because it's something that is not only an unstable statistic, yeah. even for some of the better ones. Like DeAndre Hopkins is one of the only wide receivers in the league. I mean, right. DK DK Metcalf's the same, but yeah. Metcalf is truly like an all world freak show athlete. Yeah. Right. And if, if you're not that, like if you're not an alien, yeah, Deandre Hopkins is basically the only one doing contested catches at an incredibly high rate every single year at a really high level. Great point. A lot of the other dudes, they just, it, it just, they might have one really good year, but it doesn't work out for them. It just yeah. does not work out. So Coleman is again, Really tough to quit because of kind of the kind of athlete he is, but the lack of separation and the inviting of contested catches just really worries me. It worries yeah. me how much more polish you have in there because it's easy to watch his tape and say, okay, well, when he gets more polish as a receiver, right. will he? I don't think that's always a guarantee. That's a good point. The, the other guy, skill position wise, I want to talk to you about again, a top 30 visit for the Buccaneers. I'm not, you know, championing K Staters. This is a guy that the Bucs. Right in for a top 30 visit. Mm -hmm. uh, ben Sennett from Kansas State, who uh, I like better than Cooper Beebe, like Alien Mastodon says. And, and I think this guy does have some upside. He's a willing blocker. Uh, you talked about maybe getting an upgrade at the tight end position over K. Dotton. I think that he is faster and more athletic than K. Dotton is. What are your thoughts on on um, on Ben Sennett? I've seen him everywhere from uh, you know a late riser up in the second round to as low as the fourth round. Which yeah, I think he was drafted. Right. I, I I think he's I think he's gonna be a day two pick. I really do. I, yeah. I don't I don't know if it's gonna be as high as the second round. Again, just because there's so many good offensive linemen, corners, wide receivers to be had. Yeah. Uh and, and even like interior defensive linemen to be had. Like maybe he gets in there, but I think I'm more comfortable saying that he'd be off the board in the third. Yeah, I think he's a third round pick. Yeah. The way that I have the tight end group kind of like tiered right now is mm -hmm. Brock Bauer is in a tier of his own. I, I think Jatavian Sanders is also kind of in a tier of his own because he's, I'm not putting him in Brock Bowers tier, but right. he's so athletic. He's got such high potential. I can't really put him with the other guys. So he's kind of in a tier of his own, which I don't yeah. like doing that, like starting with two singular tiers, but it kind of is what it is. Yeah. 
And then the third tier, I've got Eric All from Iowa, Mm -hmm. who's, I think, a fantastic athlete and a really great tight end. He just has some injury history to him. Um, Ben Sennett, who is in there. And yeah. then uh, Cade Stover from Cade Ohio Stover. State, State are, yeah. the, are the are the the other three who I think I think Brock Bowers is going to be a first round pick, and Jatavian Sanders is going to be somewhere as a second round pick, and then I yeah. could genuinely see all three of those other tight ends in tier three being third round picks because Senate is a super all around athlete. I mean, if yeah. I remember this correctly, like he played basically every sport on the sun growing up. Yeah, um, team hockey. sport, individual player. sport like hockey, obviously, yeah. and. Kansas State used him as like this jack of all trades play. Mm-hmm. Um, ton of production this past year. I'm really glad that they leaned on it. It was a lot of fun to watch. Yeah. They used him in line. They used him as a wing back. They used yeah. him as a fullback. They used him as a slot receiver. And so that's something that when you think about players to draft in the mid rounds, yeah, as He's like got uh, incredible contact balance too. Yeah, I talked to him about it at the combine. He said, he said, man, that's from from skating around on the rink, hundred percent, and and, and, yeah. and getting and getting hit right. You're getting bumped yeah. on skates. You got to have yeah. good, you know, you, like you get the little skinny, you know, uh, um, uh, blade. You yeah, know, right, right, and and on. and you've got to and you've got to stay up. So you know, like I I think that he's really nice, and and also like there's there's a lot of like special teams ability with him too. Yeah. Right. Because special teams like t- Scott, you know, this, when you start talking about guys that'll fill out the depth of your roster, yeah. tight ends and linebackers are the two positions that you carry more of just because That's they're right. the most versatile on special teams. Yep. Tight ends and linebackers can you play so many different kicks. positions yeah. for you in punt returns and kick returns, everything. And so I'm not, I'm not saying this to like delegate Ben Senate to like special teams duty, but right in his early years, year one, year two, like you got a contributing rotational tight end and you have an A special team, right? It's making two, two phases of your game of football better in that yeah. regard. So, yep. We had a super chat here. We'll get to special teams in a second, but realtor David Zussman wants to know 499 super chat. Thank you. At what range do you think Jermaine Burton, the Alabama wide receiver would be worth the risk talent wise? He's probably number five or six. Do you see the bucks taking a chance on him? <sighs> Jermaine Burton's awesome, man. I watched Jermaine Burton's film, like really <laughs> dove into Jermaine Burton's film yeah. like two months ago. And I and I I kind of like looked around and I was like, why aren't we talking about this guy? Yeah. I, I gave him I gave him I gave him a firm second round grade on film, not like yeah. a late second round, early third. Nobody's like I gave talking this about this guy. Nobody. So the it's reason crazy. why they're not talking about him is he's on, I mean, he he bounced around so many different schools in high school. I think he played mm-hmm. for four different high schools wow. from freshman Jeez. year to senior year. Yeah. Now, obviously, like it's not, it's not like he was getting like kicked out of all these schools, but like yeah. transferred to one. You know, like I think he started in Georgia and then he went to IMG Academy for one year and then he mm-hmm. went back to Georgia and then he went to a prep school and then he went out to California for a different mm-hmm. prep school that was better for football. And and then he gets to Georgia. He's at Georgia for two years and he leaves Georgia for Alabama. And I've, I've heard that. I mean, look, we've, we've seen on the field, like he's a fiery competitor, but you can almost, yeah. you bring that to saying like, he's a hothead. Like he'll let right. his emotions and his anger get the best yeah. of him. And yeah, you know, there are Kinda been that is welcome a little bit. And you know, to yeah. what we talked about earlier in the podcast, like Jason's out here drafting people as much as players. Right. Mm-hmm. I don't think Jermaine Burton's going to be on their draft board. Just because yeah. I I don't know a lot of people who have a lot of glowing reviews about him. There's a lot of they really didn't even interview him at the combine, not even informally. Which there's a, a like, lot of 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 people in this industry that I respect a lot. Yeah, that have not said one peep about a guy who no. I think has arguably top fifty tape in this class, yeah. and that to me that speaks, speaks volumes. volumes. Yeah, like I, we're going to get to day three of the draft and you're yeah. going to see those best available. Mm-hmm. And Jermaine yeah. Burton's going to be at the top of every single list. Cause he's still yeah. going to be there in, in, uh, in round four. Can we get a little overtime with you? Can we get of a course. couple more yeah. uh, questions and topics awesome. here? Uh, Dominic uh, Tarantino with a $10 super chat. Just wanted to give the NFL stock exchange a shout wow. out. If you are a draft sicko like me, see, I love that. It's we've, we've evolved from draft Nick to draft sicko. I love that. <laughs> It's because we call it's because yeah. Connor and I realize that we're watching so many players and we're doing we're talking right. draft 365. Like we're talking about the draft in like September. So now exactly. Connor and I just call it yeah. sickos like yep. us who are just yep. talking about the draft. I September. love it. But yeah. if you're a draft sicko like me and you want entertaining <laughs> year-round draft coverage, you need to subscribe to Trevor's pot. I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah, and I that. 
I uh, that's, that's the pick right there. That's it. yeah, I concur with the that. Is it that. is a great show. I mean, yep. obviously, you guys have so much insight, but the banter back and forth, obviously, mm-hmm. is uh, is awesome. Got another one from uh, Ren Dax, kind of going uh, Peter Report history here. Ren says, Trevor, did you know that Scott blocked a punt in high school? <laughs> what? Okay, you did. Wait, wait, wait. You have the finger. Yes, the finger, you told yeah, me. There's the finger. Yeah, yeah. Right there. yeah, yeah. you've told you've told me this. You've I've told you've, that story a couple of times. You've you've shown me the uh, the the broken yeah, finger. Yeah, I have I have kind of like a, I don't know if you can see it, but like I kind of have like a crooked finger right here, and that was from uh, playing flag football actually. Yeah. So um, yeah, not as I didn't have as much glory on the high school fil- uh, field as blocking a punt, but uh, yeah. yeah, I've got a little got a little hand. I went, I went to to an orthopedic well, specialist, which happened to be the assistant football coach and happened to be the PE teacher. Really. He was not a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so my orthopedic uh, went to me and he, he tied a popsicle stick around yep. my fingers and he said, you'll be fine by the end of the season. Well, it never got fine. That is so funny because that is exactly what happened to me. I was well, at like, uh, say, that's how you did it back. You had this, uh, uh, orthopedic on your staff. He was your PE coach. You know, you can sit and tie your tie your your finger together with a popsicle stick and go back in there. Fine. It's it's so funny because that's what they did originally. They were just they just like taped the stick to it. And they're like, no, 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 it'll it'll grow back fine. Yeah. It's fine. Just like brace yeah. it, whatever. Right. And <laughs> I end up I end up going into like uh you know like a walk in clinic or something. You know, like three weeks later, and my finger was still like you know kind of crooked, <laughs> kind of bent. Yeah. And I, and I say to the doctor, I was like, Hey, can you like, is there anything you can do for this? And he looks at it and they obviously like run an x-ray and he's like, well, it's healed. So he's, he's like, he's like, I don't, he's like, can you make a fist for me? And I can, like, yeah. I've got full range of motion yeah. with it and it's fine. He's like, we got two options. You live with it or I can re-break your hand and we can, oh. and, and, and like, we can, we can set it back. And I was like, nah, I'm gonna die with this. We're good. We're yeah. good. Exactly. <laughs> it's my typing hand. Um, <laughs> yeah. But sticking with Peter Report history real quick, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this, but I just I just need you to confirm this, Trevor. So okay. back in the day when you were producing the podcast before I started doing it, yeah, uh, it would be Peter Report episode, like, let's just say 199. Peter I think Nation that's a, back then. Yeah, it was Peter oh, Nation yeah. podcast. Yeah. We didn't have Peter Report podcast. Yeah. But at the time, we got to a point, it was Peter Nation podcast episode 199. And then it went to Peter Nation podcast <laughs> yeah. episode 199 part two and then yes. part three and we got all the way up to like part 25 until we finally went to 200 now i'm pretty right. sure we delayed it to part two through 25 because we were what waiting for reason? a very special guest i'm pretty sure because it sparked my memory because we had him on the show during last season i'm pretty sure it was for ronde barber was going to be guest 200 and like you know the, the scheduling That's didn't right. work we were gonna have them out and that would have been episode 200 That's right, but because yeah. we were waiting for ronde we just kept doing like part 25 26 27 <laughs> so i think that that had to have been mark's idea right yeah. i mean yeah. Yeah. no <laughs> doubt no doubt Plus, I mean, the, the thing with Mark, Cookie would never let me get to the Chuck Berry story. Like he said, true. let's save that for the end of the show. That's true. That's and true. then we'd wrap it up before I could get – it took me like a year to get to the Chuck Berry story. Do you yeah. – Scott, do you remember – I'm sure you do. The first Peter Nation podcast that we did at the school, do you remember this? Could, what, the school. Probably the Connecticut School of Broadcast. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yes, cause yes, it was yeah. the one where right. Mark was like kind of teaching a class like yeah. part-time. Yes, yes. Whatever. That – that was where we hosted our very first podcast. That's right. And That's and right. I, I, I remember yes. like, because I'd never been in that building before. Yeah. And we went in there to do the first podcast. And then obviously, uh, you know, 208 episodes later, whatever it ended up being, yeah. man, what a what a fun ride that was. Oh, what a, that is an, we had so many elite, it, you know, when I run out of podcasts, you know what I'm yeah. going to do? I'm not going to do this as a narcissist. I'm going to do it because of memory lane. <laughs> when I run out of podcasts at some point, or maybe I'll yeah. do this this summer, I'm just going to start from episode one and just, yeah. just <laughs> let it, just let it fly. And just, because there were times when we laughed so hard, we oh, yeah. could not breathe. I know. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good times. Wonderful times. No yeah, doubt about it. Absolutely. Uh, Christopher Oxen team from my old stomping grounds, Overland Park, Kansas, with a five dollar super chat. What about Dylan Laub? I have a middle finger that looked like looks like Scott's finger from grabbing at Kenyon Rashid's jersey. That's so funny, Christopher, because I actually played against Kenyon Rashid. Also, he played for um, oh gosh, was um, not Parkview. What, what, what's uh, no Rockhurst? City. Rockhurst High School. Kenyon Rashid. Just so you guys know, he was like a Kansas City legend. 
played at Rockhurst High School. He was he was like a big back. He was like a Christian Okoye type back in high school. Ended up playing fullback and and back in the day they'd give fullbacks the ball like like uh, Mike Allstott, right? And so he played fullback at Oklahoma. Then ended up his in his NFL career playing for the New York Giants. But I remember getting run over by Kenyon Rashid. So apparently you did too, <laughs> Christopher, trying to, to drag him down and having a, a mangled finger like like me. But uh, your thoughts on Dylan Lab, who I, I wasn't terribly impressed with on tape. He's the right. pass, pass catching back out of North uh, New Hampshire. But he actually kind of blew me away a little bit at the Senior Bowl. I was more impressed at the Senior Bowl than I was the film. Yeah, you know, he's he's interesting because I, I think you hit the nail on the head. He's he's simply, to me, a receiving back. Like, he's somebody who I think if he's going to have a career in the NFL, yeah. it's going to be as a special teamer. It's going to be as a third-down receiver on obvious passing situations and maybe even some slot receiving yeah. responsibilities because – um, I remember when I was like, looking up his background information out of high school, he jokingly said, like, I got more looks for lacrosse than I actually did for football. And, yeah. you know, he ends up going the football route. And there was a game this past year. We had 283 receiving yards as a running back out of the backfield. Right. Like, he's not a wide receiver. He had 283 yards as a running back. Those mm-hmm. receiving yards. So, yeah. I mean, he's just he, – he's got great soft hands. He's really nice out of the backfield. The thing is, is that – when it comes to the actual running back duties, and I'm not even just talking about between the tackle stuff. Yeah. He just, he's a smaller back. He just doesn't have the power. He right. doesn't have, he does not have an NFL level top gear speed that yeah. you would want to covet as a running back. Right. And he doesn't have that, like, I'm going to hit you. There's some contact and I got the leg drive to keep going. When you yeah. hit him, it's kind of all you're going to get. He's got one of the lower yards after contact yeah. averages that we have in this draft class. And so, very specialized player, a fun specialized player. But to me, that's why you're not talking about him more as like, a, hey, this guy can be a great third down back. It's because like yeah. short yardage responsibilities, he's not going to be there for you. And he just does not have that top speed for the NFL level. Yep. Um, I, I get one more question for it. But before we do, uh, you, you definitely have some fans here because we got uh, Jonathan yep. with the <laughs> three side minimum. That is a Trevor Sikama staple right there. I've seen it in person many a times in Mobile, Alabama, and in Tampa. It's true. The three side minimum. When you get barbecue, you, bread didn't count, right? Bread didn't count it, uh, unless it unless it is a specialized type of cornbread. Like it, like yeah, if you're cornbread, getting, I can like, see. Like, like if we're you're talking getting, like like if it's Texas toast or something. No, that's yeah, just bread, right? That's just bread. Okay, that's just bread. All right. Yeah. So there's that. Uh, there's another good one here. Um, can't believe they were able to get Stamkos on the podcast right before the playoffs too. Right before the know? playoffs, yeah. yeah, great night the other night, Trevor, too on the right. ice. But I think he had a hat trick. Hat trick, yeah. yeah. I know, yeah, Good yeah, stuff, dude. Man. They're uh, they're firing on all cylinders, man. I'm excited. I'm, I'm actually. What I hope happens is because I don't think the Bolts can catch the Leafs, right? So I think they're all probably they playing the Bruins in the first round. Which well, that's what I hope. Kind of they, I, I think they're like one more win away from. No one can catch them for the first wild card spot, mm-hmm. but then yeah. they also can't catch the Leafs. So I'm actually kind of hoping that like last two games of the year, just rest everybody. Yeah. Just like, just like give everybody like a week <laughs> off. You can't change seeds. And we know how much of a grind the postseason oh, yeah. is. Give them, give them, give them a little bit of time off. So well, I think, I think yeah, that was like, uh, that there. was like the Bucks a couple of seasons ago. It was like, will Tom Brady play? Like they should right. play Kyle Trask. And then Trask got in for like the fourth quarter against Atlanta. So it's just like that. Yep. Brady okay. told him to beat it. Jay yeah. says, good to see Trevor so successful with the draft because he's so bad. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Jay is a uh, a member of of Lot Six Crew, which was uh, the group of people that. Uh, so so Scott, right? Like yeah. when we would go to games, when mm-hmm. we would go to home games at Ray J, yep. they open up the tailgate lots right. three hours before the game. Didn't didn't Mark Cook want to fight somebody in Lot Six as well? <laughs> no, that was at the, that was at the, the gas station. No, that was at yeah. the gas station. Okay. That was that was that was for a preseason game because remember, okay. like preseason games is. The, yeah. At that time of the year, actually, in that time of the Bucks history, right, that was the only time that Tampa was ever going to get a night game. Was That's if it right. was the preseason, because every other game was going to be at one p.m. Yep. Yep. And I remember this: me, we it was it. It was like a seven p.m. eight p.m. kick. So because we're doing the podcast afterwards, we're not getting out there till like one. Right. right? It's yep. it's well after midnight. Yeah. Mark said he had to go get gas. Stops for gas. He said there was there was a homeless guy who walks up to him 
right. and he goes, he goes, Hey buddy, you want to fight? <laughs> and Mark, he's now I, I obviously wasn't there, but he says, he's like, I was so tired that without <laughs> missing a beat, I just went, dude, I'm really not feeling it tonight. You mind if we do it tomorrow? And he, and, and the homeless guy went, yeah, dude, it's no problem. And then just like walks away. Like that was it. Like that was the whole oh my God. interaction. Yeah. But anyway, so, so the tailgate lots wouldn't open until three hours yeah. before the game. You remember, I like to show up really early. One, oh, yeah. you, you know, you get, yeah. get an extra plate of, of uh, a press box food. Sure. So, you know, it's like, wrong with that? A little strategic yeah, there. It's one of the best. You're growing like boy. Yeah. set up. And honestly, yeah. like, you know, being a little sentimental, like, mm-hmm. ha- having credentials to cover the team that I grew up watching. That's yep. a big reason why I love the game of football. Like yeah. I could, I could never get enough of it. I yeah. always wanted to be in there as much as possible. That's why I stayed super late with y'all. Just cause like yep. sitting there and hanging out with Rick and Greg and Jenna and like all you guys, it was just yeah. like, that was genuinely fun to me. But when I would show up about three hours early, sometimes I'd, I'd, I'd park next to where Jay and the rest of those guys were right. and I'd sit around and Jay would either make some broths or some shrimp or something yeah. that he was good cooking up on the grill. And then I'd play a little cornhole with him before I, and apparently not, not very well, according to Jay. <laughs> okay. That's, I mean, that's some slander that I won't let stand here on this last show. But, uh, yeah. All right. So uh, the last question I have for you, a uh, football related and Matt, feel free to jump in afterwards here is, when it comes to special teams, the Bucks should be looking to draft an elite returner for special teams. Jason actually talked today yeah. about this new kick return rule. And mm-hmm. now all of a sudden it's it's not a dead wasted play. I, do you have that clip, Matt, or is that one of the ones? Uh, yeah, he gave a shout out to right. Sketch. Let me all right, let's do it up real let's, quick. Let's yeah. no, no. A little bit more of an emphasis to maybe try to find somebody or maybe it's a wide receiver or running back that, that you like, but also bring some more kick return ability because of the new rules. Yeah, for sure. It's going to become kind of a more of an offensive play almost um, with the way that teams are going to scheme it. None of us really know exactly how it's going to look because we haven't done it yet, but we haven't, we have a thought of what it's going to be like. We've had a lot of discussions about it. So it's going to put a premium on that type of returner, whether it's going to be a punt returner or a kick returner, or like I said, it's going to be kind of an offensive play. Um, so those special teams, special plays, special players, shout out to sketch. It's uh that's, those are the, um, we're going to put an emphasis on that. All right. I, I, I'm the that's, old man in the room. I had no idea who so, the hell the sketch was. That's I'm unbelievable. Like, like, when he first said it, I was like, wait, did he just say shout out to sketch? And I only like oh somewhat know, I know he's like a streamer and, and he, it's and everything. Twitch, right? but he was like, wait, shout out to sketch. I'm like, wait, yeah. what? That's amazing. Uh, yeah, that's why uh, Jason's the best. Jason's well, a man of the people. That's no, he is. There's no he doubt is. about it. So you know when, when he when he's saying that, right? It's more of an offensive play, right? Because mm-hmm. now you're essentially going to have a, a like like a line of scrimmage, right? These guys, right? The, the, the kick coverage unit, the kick uh, blocking unit, they're like what five ten yards apart, and it's on the the return side of the field, right? And so. I think it lends itself to, to getting more of a wide receiver running back that that has the ability to hit the holes and 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 find some some you know guys that can do end rounds right and and, mm-hmm. and get the ball in motion things like that. Um, Malachi Corley is a player that has drawn comparisons to Debo Samuel, and and I, I like him a lot. He's one of my draft crushes. Um, you know, I think Debo coming out of South Carolina, probably a bit more polished as a receiver. This guy was the Yak yes. King. He was the yes. slot guy, was the screen player at Western Kentucky. But, man, I love his build. And you talk about a guy that can break tackles, that's physical, mm-hmm. that has some shake to his game in, in short areas. I mean, some of the, of the yards that he gets on those screen passes and all that garbage, right, all, all the traffic. I'm just thinking this is a player the Bucks brought in for a top 30 visit. And, you know, maybe he develops as a receiver. Maybe he becomes that slot guy that eventually replaces Chris Godwin and helps out this year. But he could help out as a kick returner, even though he doesn't have experience doing it, because it is going to be more like an offensive play, I think. Right. Yeah. I mean, like, he, that's that's totally the way that you got to approach it. It's it's not just, hey, let's put our fastest guy back there and see how fast he can run out of the end zone and as far as he can run out of the end zone before the guys come and tackle him. It, it, it's more of those guys who have great yards after catch and even out of the backfield vision. Like, I I think that, I think this special teams 
uh, change is now going to really prioritize running backs specifically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. getting these positions. Whereas really it, 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 I mean, maybe you'd see some running backs get some punt return drills, but mm -hmm. really like it's, it's fast wide receivers. Like those are the guys that you kind of want back there to be able to give you that speed element. And now it's going to be different because you're it's closer to reading the line of scrimmage than mm -hmm. it is anything else. So yeah. I look at, man, guys with phenomenal vision, like again, a Bucky Irving, a Blake mm -hmm. Corum, like guys like that who are just, they see the line so well and they have such great RB vision that that can be huge for special teams. Corley, certainly, I think you can throw him into that as well because of how great he is after the catch. Yeah. Um, are, are there any other like return specialists guys that that have kind of done it the more conventional way, bringing out of the end zone? Yeah, that, I mean, that, like Tyron Leggett had a big time kickoff return, but but who are some of the special teams guys? Who are the guys that were the punt and kick return guys that that could help the Buccaneers? Yeah, I think that like Xavier worthy has the highest punt return grade over the last year for us. I mean, speed's a big, a big part of that. And, mm -hmm. and I think that he's just such a playmaker when he gets the ball in that much space mm -hmm. uh, because of his speed. So I think he's in there. Cooper DeGene honestly mm -hmm. is in there as well. I think he's a phenomenal natural athlete to be a great punt returner. Um, like I think Will Shipley, the running back from Clemson, mm -hmm. I think has really yeah. good punt return vision. You mentioned Xavier Leggett. He's had a lot of uh, yeah. success on special teams. I think Tyrone Tracy as well, former wide receiver, now running back Purdue, coming out yeah. of Purdue. Like he is somebody who I think could be great at that at that role at the NFL level. So those are a handful that kind of come to my mm -hmm. mind. I mean, like Daquan Hardy is another one from Penn State who smaller dude super fast but that's more of the traditional kind of like punt return yeah. it's it's less of kind of the the new kick return rules but um yeah those are a handful of names that come to my mind trevor last one for me and we got a quick super chat we can get to as well but just curious to get your thoughts on the whole nfc south we know what the box did obviously kirk cousins was a huge move to atlanta mm -hmm. the saints seem to always stick around and be there at the end of the season uh, I know there's a long way to go and the draft hasn't even happened yet, but just your thoughts on the NFC South. Like, is it, is it a three team race? Are the Falcons the favorite now with cousins? Is it still the Bucks division to lose? How do you see it? Yeah, I guess it's a three team race. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely not putting Carolina in that conversation yet. I mean, they, they've, they've lost so much talent. Um, even this off season, I know they brought yeah. a lot of guys in and, and they're hoping that they're taking a step in the right direction, but to me, it's not going to be this year. Like unless Bryce Young has a year of this year, reminiscent of what CJ Stroud had last year, yeah. they're they're not going to be competing even in a, I'll say still like a lower ceiling division in the NFC South this year. But mm -hmm. it is, it's the Saints, the Falcons, and the Bucks. I think you're going to see a lot of books in Vegas come out with the Falcons as as the yeah. on favorite to win right. the division, just because you have that proven quarterback in 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 Kirk Cousins, and he's joining a team with so many great. Uh, pass catching weapons, a really good offensive line, Bijan Robinson. Now they got to get their defense fixed, right? They got to get a lot better at getting after the passer. Yeah. Uh, gotta find another corner to play outside of, of AJ Terrell. Jesse Bates is great on the back end, but they need another safety to play next to him as well. Um, linebackers could certainly use an upgrade. And, and also it's like, it's a brand new head coach. Like I, mm -hmm. Morris getting in there. I like yeah. Zach Robinson, their offensive coordinator, but it's new stuff. Sometimes yeah. it's take a little bit of time to figure out. So, I don't think it's this guarantee of like, yeah, the Falcons are going to hit the ground running. Like they're all good to go. They're going to win this division. I think it's a really good three team race. The saints, you know, you can't count them out, but it's also hard to have a lot of faith in this team yeah. because yeah. they I'm going to be honest. Like they probably should have won the division last year, but mm -hmm. they underperformed so poorly that they right. opened the door for Tampa to, I think overperform. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I don't mean that as an insult to them. Like I'm giving them credit sure. and win the division again. So if, if the saints weren't going to do it last year. Right. I, it, I mean, the, you're right. The, the bucks were four and seven. They were kind of left for it, dead. And exactly. And New Orleans and, couldn't seal the deal and they could not seal the yeah. deal. And it's just it, a lot of their good players are getting older. Yeah. Uh, some of those good players that are older aren't on the team. Like Michael Thomas isn't even on the team anymore. Right. So, you know, Cam Jordan, how much does he have left in the tank? Yeah. Uh, so it's just, a lot of questions with this team, and and I, 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 I think it's a three team race, but it's it's hard to have faith in the Saints with where they're at right now. I agree. Thanks yeah. to LDBC's most wanted for this four ninety nine super chat, who says saludos. PR want to know how far out is Chris Godwin from a Ring of Honor? He's top oh, wow. five in all major receiving stats. This is an yeah. interesting one, right? Because yeah. I feel like Godwin kind of falls into the category of like Simeon Rice should be in the Hall of Fame, but he's not in the Hall of Fame yet. Um, yeah. And a couple others too. Yeah, mm. I mean, it's interesting because I mean, I mean, I think Chris Godwin's kind of like the second best receiver in Tampa, 
you know, but is like he, not, you're saying, well, oh yeah. Like I think he is, you know, I think Chris Godwin's the I second guess, best receiver. Yeah. I guess so. Yeah. But, but I'm just saying like Donnie Abraham is the second best cornerback in Bucks history, you know, but he's not going to be in the Bucks ring of honor. Right. Right. And I mean, he had like 30 interceptions. I mean, like he had like, a, that's a ton for a career. But, you know, Rondé Barber, 47, right? 17 more interceptions. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I just wonder, like, yeah, I mean, it's I, I always look at Chris Goblin and say, yeah, like you're you're Robin, but Mike Evans is Batman. You know, it's like you're you're I, I think he's maybe a little bit better than a sidekick. Right. Because of the thousand yard seasons. But I, I wouldn't be against having Chris Goblin in the Bucks ring of honor. But I don't know that I could champion him. Into the I Bucks think ring of honor I either. think you, you well. I think the question is like, because this, this is Godwin's last year on his contract, right? Yeah, yeah. So like, if Godwin leaves after this year, basically, is he a Bucks Ring of Honor member? Yeah. And I don't, I don't think he is. And I, 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 I truly don't mean that as any slight to Chris Godwin. Yeah, he agreed. has been incredible as again a player, a person, everything for the organization. But I, I don't think he is if he, if he, if this is his last contract in Tampa Bay. Now, if he signs another three year deal and right. plays into his, you know, 31, 32, then yep. very clearly it's the gap, the gap of him and Mike Evans versus the rest of the receivers that have ever played for Tampa Bay yeah. becomes yeah. so wide that it right. becomes a conversation that you go, yep. okay, yeah, we're thinking about this dude as a, as a Ring of Honor member. I did not realize that. Evans is obviously very clearly number one in every category, yeah. but Godwin is Godwin be, is is second in targets. He's mm -hmm. second in receptions. He's second yeah. in receiving yards. Mm -hmm. He's second in receiving touchdowns. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. and he's only had five over the last two years. I know. That is That's wild. Yeah. He's, wow, he's number two. Yeah. yeah, we did. Man, this franchise just does not have. A lot of good receivers. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that is unbelievable that they have been around I mean, for I mean, next, you're talking, 40 you know, more plus years. Yeah, you're talking, you know, Mark Carrier after that. You're talking Keyshawn Johnson, Keenan McCardell. I mean, it's it's that level. And, and I think it's a big drop, right, from, from Godman, who's had 4,000 yard receiving seasons in his career, you know? <laughs> Hold on. I got to know this. Gronkowski is top 20 all time in receiving tight touchdowns for this, mm -hmm. for this. <laughs> yeah. Like Cam Brates, yeah. Cam Brates up there with like reception. Cam Brates, Cam Brates fourth. Touchdowns. Yeah. Yeah. He's exactly. fourth. Right. Yeah. He, okay. He's fourth and he's one behind Jimmy Giles for third, mm -hmm. who is right now tied with Chris Godwin for correct second. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, can't, can't Cam Ray bring him back for a game? Cam Ray bring him on? You know what I'm saying? I yeah, mean, yeah. we're having this kind they gotta of start exactly, a, They yeah. got to start a Bucks Hall of Very Good and put right. like Cam Ray and Chris Godwin and a couple others in there. Yeah. Incredible. Well, listen, uh, we got a shout out here, Mark Cook from Supply and Demand. It's hey, always man. fun bringing you on, Trevor, because yep. we, get, we get the best of both worlds with Trevor. We get the old time uh, Pewter Nation listeners back when we called our podcast that. And and the, the people that remember the audio podcast before the visual, you know, and then uh, and you heard Trevor say it. I mean, I mean, Matt and I were right there with Kay Adams. So, I mean, the, <laughs> we're, we're glad that we have the visual now so you can see how good looking we are. Yeah. And Trevor's not bad looking either. Uh, but uh, but yeah, so we're we're super excited to have you on, especially this time of year, because, man, you know, when, when I first hired you, I, what I loved about you was you were deep into Buccaneer knowledge and in, 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 in the, the present day of football, but you also have the eye on college because of the draft. Cause it's such a huge part of what we do in the off season. We run into mm -hmm. you every year at the senior bowl and at the combine and doing all the draft stuff too. So always a pleasure having you on brother. It's, it's, it's great. It's like yes. you never left um, uh, wishing you nothing but the best of PFF and, and uh, so excited to see your career take off and, and flourish not just for the Tampa Bay fans, but now for the National Football yep. League fans that get to enjoy you too for all 32 teams. Every not time just we one. see you, every time we see I see you on TV, I'm like, there's Trevor, there's Trevor, mm -hmm. let's go. So yeah, so it's great. Guys, I appreciate it so much. Scott, Matt, uh, y'all are the best. This is I I I don't say this is like a brag. Like I do a lot of shows at this time of year. This wow. was this was so much fun to do. Like this is so easy. This yeah. is turn on the camera, hang out with your buddies, talk a little yeah. bit of football with it. So um, but that's what I feel like made the Pewter Nation podcast and now the Pewter Report podcast yeah. so great because that's how it has always felt like it. And you guys do a great job of carrying that identity through. So 
I appreciate the kind words. It means a lot. Obviously, right back at you. I think y'all are the best at covering that beat and everything that you do. So y'all are appreciate so wired it, and wired everything, man. It's uh, it's just always a lot of fun to kind of come yeah. back and yeah. you know dust off the roots, if you will. Yeah. I always remember yeah. that they're there, but sometimes it's tough to pay as much attention to Tampa football as I would like. So this is always a lot of fun when I get to uh, to really dust that off and get to talk some yeah. fun football. And so we I'm started at 4.02, exactly. which was two minutes late. Why? Because we were doing the show before the show, and that's the big neuro, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the four of us, Matt, and even Grizz, too, and and uh, and Mark and, and Trevor and I, we'd sit there, and we'd start, like, like talking about the show, and we'd have, like, really good content, and Trevor would be like, stop, stop, we, we can't yeah. do the like show you're before doing the, the podcast show. before the podcast. And there, <laughs> there were a bunch of times where, like, Mark, especially, I'll just, I'll just say, during the yeah. Dirt Cutter era, where yeah. we were sometimes pulling our hair out about some stuff that we yeah. were watching. And Mark would, like, say stuff before we we're going to record. And I'm like, yeah. say that. Save it. Leave yeah. out the cuss words, but, like, <laughs> just say that, you know? And so it's, you know, that's that's how doing the pod before the pod started. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, great times as always. Appreciate it. We'll have you on um, after the draft. And, yeah, and let's after, do it. We'll, we'll evaluate the NFC South draft and see how the Bucks stack up and, and all of that. But uh, uh, great stuff. Uh, you can you can find him at Pro Football Focus. Um, you also have this handle called Tampa Bay Trey. I do. I won't give yeah. it up either. Don't I won't give it up. It up. I love that. Even about though you. I live in Carolina and love people want to call you. me Carolina Trey, you know, you can't get to me. I'm not giving it up. I'm not giving this handle up. That's Trey awesome. Palmer never had a chance. Never had a chance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The original folks. Yeah. Trevor set so, them up for pro football focus. Thank you very much, Trevor. Make sure you're following Trevor. Make sure you follow us on all of our social media at Peter Report on X, Facebook, Instagram. Our YouTube channel is Peter Report TV. Please like and subscribe to leave a comment. Got a big series of shows next week. We're going to have Servacier Dennis joining us, which should be a great time. And, of course, we got our Pewter Report live draft show. Day one starts on April 25th at 7 p.m. Eastern time. So a lot of great things coming for us. We'll get to the Chuck Berry next time, story next time because we are running out of time. Um, until next week, for Trevor Sikama, for Scott Reynolds, I'm Matt Matera saying thanks, everybody, for watching. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next week for another edition of the Pewter Report podcast. Out. Out. Out.